of a wake-up call I had last week. And I'm not talking about my wife yelling at me to get up. She never has to do that, by the way. When I was younger, yeah, but not now. When you get to a certain age, you just kind of, yeah. Anyhow, you know what I'm saying. One scripture has been going through my heart. And by the way, the title of this message today has to do with the hungry he fills with good things. And the rich or full, he sends away empty. It's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 53. And it's that great, magnificent worship that took place with uh, Mary as she recognized God's grace upon her life, that he has regarded my low estate. The Lord who is mighty hath done great things to me and holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. And this is the key verse. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. That will be my springboard text this morning. And I've, I feel literally, literally feel with weakness and much trembling because God wants to move us out of a church that comes for a one hour event. And we never touch one another other than those brief moments. And I know what the last couple of years have cost us in the area of being able to greet one another with a handshake or a hug and and again, I've, I've said it many times, I'll say it again, I don't have an issue with if you want to wear a mask, if you don't want to wear a mask, uh, nobody wants anybody to get sick. We want to step into what God says is our heritage as a people of God. And that's to know that when we gather, there's something release of the kingdom. That something of the release of the power of the Holy Spirit is released when we gather. So I want to pick up just a little bit with what I shared last week. And the message was called, Jesus has a message for you. And basically we talked about the fact that he warned us of last days. It's not a doomsday thing, but he said, this is the environment in which you will be living in these last days. And it's really a hopeful message that we can depend on God to do what he promises to do, that in the darkest of night, he will still be the light. And let me just make this very clear. He is the light, but you are the light as well. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Because there's something we have to learn again as a congregation. And I I really, uh, I'll talk about that wake up call in a minute. But last week, God shook me to the core of my being. Because something that I had not seen and observed and afterwards, I couldn't get it out of mind for a week. And uh, prayed almost, almost every day on this very subject. We talked about last week, and I just want to touch on this one thing. When, when Jesus talked about us being hot or cold, and he taught in Mark or Matthew 24, he said, because iniquity will abound, because lawlessness and sinfulness will abound, and we're seeing that in our country, the love of many will wax cold. Mm-hmm. Now, I always thought when I read that, that it meant that people in the world would just be more and more lawless and more and more disrespectful and more and more whatever. But that word Jesus was talking about, was talk, he was talking to us, the church, his people. Because of everything that's going around, on, around us, we are tending to be cooled. And here's, here was the interesting term that I looked up in the lexicon, and I'd never seen this before. The meaning of the, the people growing cold comes from the idea of a spiritual energy Blighted or chilled by a poisonous wind. Where there is a breath of something. A breath, a wind of change that's blowing against people in the midst of these hard times that makes you just kind of want to give up. In fact, I heard just the other day that another famous, now infamous Christian artist who's been presenting a message through rap music suddenly exposed the, the fact that he has given up his faith and walked away. 
I mentioned this last week that 4,000 pastors in 2020 quit the ministry altogether. And the unfortunate thing is many quit their, stop believing in the God that they had preached about for years. We must be careful that when Jesus says there is a wind blowing, that it doesn't cool our fervor for God. And at the same time, understand that the way you stay on fire for God is when the breath of the Holy Spirit, when he blows upon the coals of your heart, that he ignites a flame. He ignites those embers that were just glowing and he ignites them into a powerful flame. Jesus gave the call, everybody come and drink of the water. Now, I've many times over the years preached from Psalm 106, and I want to just mention this as well. Israel, God dealt directly with with Israel, supernatural things that happened. The Bible says in 106 of Psalms, it says, God saved his people for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the sea, the Red Sea also. I'm sorry, let me say that again. He rebuked the Red Sea also. And he dried it up so that Israel could walk through the depths as they were walking like through a wilderness on dry ground. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of their enemy. And the waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. Then they believed his words and they sang praises. Whoop de doo. They should have done that, but here's the sad thing. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, wanting to control their environment. They tested God in the desert. How many know what he was they were crying about? We want something to eat. We, want, we don't want any more manna. We want meat. What's so weird about that is they left Egypt with cattle. What's their problem? They just wanted to complain. So he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. This is so important to get, dear ones. We're going through a thing right now that we really like God to just get it out of our way. But you know what? It's bringing us to a point of awareness of God's dealing with us as a people, as a nation, as, and as the church. Yeah. Yes. Give me what I want when I want it. And all of a sudden the Lord says, this is what you want. It's not that he gives the wrong thing. It's that well, you, you keep pers- persisting on what you want. So he says, I'll let them have what they wanted, but send a wasting disease or a leanness in their soul. There wasn't the flame and fire of God that once was there. Leanness of soul is defined, and I love this, was defined years ago by Mario Murillo, an evangelist in Southern California, said, the leanness of soul is a partial withdrawal of God's presence that leaves a restless dissatisfaction. When we've decorated our Christian walk with all the outward trinkets of immature blessing, leaving a yawning inner lack. An outward, outward sense of completeness with an inner weakness and a lack of normal appetite to grow in God. A revolving door of staying in the same level of prayer and walk with God, just content with staying alive, just existing When we talk victory, we live defeat. We talk of joy, but we live in constant depression. We read books and listen to CDs and tapes and whatever, only coming away with slogans without substance. Our converts can dance in the church, but can't stand against temptation. We can revel in exotic doctrines, but stumble at basic truths of discipleship. We have some results at the altar, but struggle to get along or to get long-term disciples. We revel in the appearance of success, a false sense of accomplishment. Yet the statistics show that over 1 million people, and this statistic has changed, this is an old article that over 1 million people confess to be Christians. It's actually greater than that, who confess to be Christians. Yet the changes that Christians should bring to their environment 
are not obvious as they should be. Even though in the midst of all this darkness, God is still at work. God is still doing things that we can't see. And we, be, we better begin to acknowledge that in the midst of the darkness, God's light still shines. And he is not taking a back seat to anything. The God who created this universe sustains it. And this same God that we serve is not ignorant of what's going on. And his heart breaks for what's happening in our world and wants to see a great revival. Again, I'm reading an old Time Magazine article that during some of the first waves of revival, it says we've got a lot of church growth, but not genuine revival. In reading history, a genuine revival is not adding members to the church, but is an outbreak of God. When the excitement leaps from the pulpit to the pew and energizes a kind of Christian that rises up over their weaknesses and is recognized as a person of God, regardless of what they're saying. They become the conscious of their community so that the community becomes fearful of behaving in a manner that would offend the person of God. You see, God really ordained the church, the people of God, to be that salt in the earth that keeps us from rotting in our own filth our own failures. That's why we're here. So how do I connect that this morning to the message of hungering and thirsting after God? He fills the hungry with good things and the rich he sends empty away. The question I want to ask this morning is what are you hungry for? This is what we should be hungering for. Here's what the word says in Psalm 27. Here's the one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. I want to live with him every moment in his very presence. Beholding the marvelous beauty of God, his sweetness, friendship, favor, knowing his delight in me. Not just seeing the majesty of God, but recognizing how much he loves you, how much he loves me. And listen carefully. That we would recognize the goodness of his splendor, loveliness, and majesty. To be filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace, and to be surrounded by his holiness. To hear his voice say, come, seek my face. And when I heard that, this is what the psalmist said, Psalm 27. I said, I am seeking your face with all my heart. And then he follows it up with this last little line. He says, Lord, do not hide yourself when I'm praying to find you. My question is, is there a desperate cry in your heart for the presence of God like was in David's heart? In fact, Psalm 28, 1, David said this, To you, Lord, I cry. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those that go down to the pit. He's referring to, I might as well give up and die. And it's in a couple places in the Psalms. I'll, I'll read another one in just a moment. But it's not just going to the grave. It's, a, a, it's the idea of being thrown into a pit with virtually no value or no uh, legacy. Without you, Lord. Now listen carefully. I'm the only one supposed to be talking this morning. All right. Listen carefully. He said, I will be like those who got into the pit. 143.7 of, of Psalm says, answer me quickly. Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Here's the passionate cry of those who want an encounter with God. I have a lot of other scripture I want to share this morning, but I want to, and I'll probably get to it sometime in the next week or so. But I want to talk about this thing of desperation for God. Jesus reminded us in the Laodicean church in Revelation 3. He said, you become hot, or you become lukewarm rather, neither hot or cold. And he says, I'm counseling with you to come and to find communion, sweet presence with Jesus. But you know what? Too often our Western order of things we presume that we can sit and hear a sermon and walk out the door and we got it. And I want to tell you right now, you don't got it. And I've been doing this for a long, long time. And I don't got it either. That's not good English, mom. Sorry. My mother down here 
has been a teacher forever. She's 94 and she still looks gives me the evil eye if I don't say the right things. <laughs> Love you, Mama. God was moving last week in our service. And I... I'm, It, it dawned on me that I fell into not a lukewarmness, but the concern that somehow the expectation of those that come here would somehow, that I had to meet an expectation, expectation, you know, preach a good sermon, have a good worship service, great band, you know, handsome pastor. <laughs> I just made that up. I threw that in. Let's see if you were awake. So, <laughs> but something happened last week and I almost missed it. In fact, I'm going to, if uh, Kenya's not here right now, by the way, she would like to take our little girlies in this place. If you've seen Kenya dance, do her worship dance, she'd like to take our little girls and teach them how to worship with the dance. She said, would that be okay? I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But last week, and I'm kind of glad she's not here for just these moments, because I wouldn't want to embarrass her. I don't think she'd be embarrassed. But last week, she stood silently right there weeping. And I didn't see it. And her daddy said, would you pray? And I looked and I realized I had not noticed. And that bothered me, first of all, that God could be moving on someone's heart in this place. And we would be oblivious to it. We're full. Looking at the watch, I need to get to lunch. Chili's got a table for me. I usually get some kind of rise out of people over that, but the, the bottom line is we have become a people who are all too quick to get on with our lives. Not that these few moments are something in, the, in and of themselves, the value, but it's the words and it's the pleading of the Holy Spirit that is active in a place, and it should be, to the point that we all recognize either God's dealing with us or someone else, and that if somehow we are so full of whatever that we are not willing to hear and to sense what God is saying. I went over and put my arm around and just softly prayed. And God said, you are missing something that this church and the world around us is hungry for. And that's for, encounter, for an encounter with God Amen. that changes lives. It's not just about emotion, though emotions are touched. It's not just about, you know, the cerebral value that we put on, I think, because we're understanding different <laughs> principles or concepts. But listen, principles and concepts don't give life. They explain some of the things, but the thing that brings life is the Holy Spirit dealing with people. We have way too much religion in this world. We have churches filled, and I'm not criticizing any church, but I'm just telling you, feeling guilty myself of the pressure of getting through a service and watching the time until the Holy Spirit, if he wants to move, has to check with us first instead of saying, I want to move on my people. And you know, some of us here, it's been so long since we had God touch us in a way that we knew that his presence, his anointing was here. That we've gotten used to walking out in our fullness and not realizing the hungry. He fills with good things. But the rich, the full, those who are full of whatever will walk away empty. I'm telling you, the reason why people are abandoning faith today <clears throat> isn't because God has failed. It's because we have not made ourselves available to the inner working and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives Amen. that would stir us to a point of saying, how long has it been? You remember the old Stuart Hamlin song? How long has it been since you talked to the Lord and told him all your hidden secrets? How long has it been? I have a song I've sung for years from Evangelist Lowell Lundstrom. And I broke it out a couple of weeks ago in my office and just began to sing. Have you ever come to Jesus down on your knees? 
Have you ever come to Jesus and told him of your needs? Have you ever tried to satisfy yourself in worldly things? The greatest joy you're missing is the joy that Jesus brings. Do you turn away when Jesus calls and asks you to come in? You say, I haven't time for Christ, but then you go and live in sin. Where do you want to spend the ages of eternity? The price for sin is death, my friend. Come to Jesus on your knees. Have you ever come to Jesus and found his love so true? This is what we're supposed to be about, dear ones, is to find this place of the manifest presence of God. We should come through those doors with an expectancy. In fact, scripture that stood out to me is in Jeremiah 6, 14. It says, they have healed also the hurt of my daughter. The hurt of my daughter. And let me read it again. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there really was no peace. It goes on to say in that passage of scripture, it says, stand at the crossroads and look and see the best way or that old fashioned way and walk in it. But they said to me, no, we will not walk in it. I remember this message because Pastor sitting here this morning from the Vineyard Church preached on that when we were at his facility. And it shook me. We've dismissed the things that once mattered to us because it's not contemporary. I want to tell you something. I found my call to the ministry at five years old at an altar in Amarillo, Texas with my dad. He went up the altar. I went up there. He took out a hanky. I took out a hanky. He blew his nose. I blew my nose. But I was five years old when I heard God say he will preach the gospel. Oh, you can't know that. I'm f- old. I started to tell you. But that call lasted my whole life. Amen. Every move of God that's ever happened in my life happened at an altar because the Spirit of God touched me in the pew and I went to the altar as a prophetic act and to fall on my face before God and say, Jesus, I need you in my life because there's something of a heritage that we've been called to as Christians that we will make a difference in our world because of what we believe. And I tell you, sometimes the world looks at us and they don't see a difference. We still have all the worries, fears, doubt, and depression that everybody else has. And, but what, what, is that, what is that lack? What's that leanness in our soul? Is because we've forgotten the work of the Lord and what he wants to do. And, and listen, I, you'll hear me talk a lot in the weeks ahead about crying out for the manifest presence of God and the power of God to be released. But I want to tell you something. Before that comes, there must be that intimacy with God Because it's not either or, it's this and that. The intimacy with God, the tender, deep working of God in your life that manifests through a work of Jesus in your life that manifests in power, in witness outside of the four walls of this church. As a shepherd of this flock, under the authority of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, and under the leading of the Holy Spirit, I'm calling for a return to the altars of this sanctuary. God wants more than great sermons and services. He wants to revive, and I know this will bother some people, an old fashioned meeting yes. at the altar of surrender. Yes. Mikey, if you could just play softly the music we talked about earlier. My calling into my ministry, as I just said, happened at an altar. The hunger for God to baptize me with the Holy Spirit came in Bishop, California. When we were doing a VBS for the Life Bible College team. And I was seeking the Lord to be filled with this Holy Spirit. And I went out to, we were sleeping outside because there was no place to sleep there on the reservation. So my brothers and I were sleeping in the back of a Dodge station wagon, I think. (laughs) 
on sleeping bags. And I remember that night as I lay out there with my hands up say, God, I know you're real. Fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. And then it came like the rain of heaven. And I began to pray and speak with other tongues as I worshiped the Lord. It changed my life. Every time I backslid, I went to an altar at either church or at camp. And I remember the church I grew up with, one of the churches I grew up in was just, it was not a place that teenagers would flock to. I went there because my mother, God bless her, said, you're going to church, pal. And I'm really glad she did. Because even though I didn't relate very much to what was happening up there, I related to something that God was doing in that service. And I remember going to the altar. And I remember crying out to God. Because I had lived like a little fool that week. And I was walking away from the Lord. And I felt my little sister behind me praying over me. At an altar. At that altar came a rededication. The camp meeting experiences. All people say, well, you can't go by experiences. Oh, dear land. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you're walking across a railroad track and you almost get hit by a train and someone pushed you off the tracks in time, I tell you right now, you're going to have some trauma and you're going to remember it. And God rescued me from a horrible pit and took me out of those things that could have destroyed my life. At an altar in Glendale, California, in 1965, I was at an altar in the Glendale Four Square Church. Guest speaker was Jack Hayford, Pastor Jack from Church on the Way. And during the service, a woman began to cry out under demonic oppression. And as a teenager, I was freaked out like everybody else in the place. But I looked over and I was watching, you know, because kids do that. When something weird goes on, all the teenagers are going, what is this? And I remember watching this thing and saw her speak out several times. Horrible, disruptive screeching. And Pastor Jack looked out there and said, my dear sister, that your neighbor will be met in a moment. So if you'll hold your peace. Well, very soon after that, another eruption happened of demonic manifestation. Now, some of you are sitting there going, oh, pastor, dear God, don't talk about demons in church. (laughs) The Bible teaches that Jesus taught us about demons. Anyhow, I remember the second thing that Pastor Jack said is he said, now I'm not speaking to you, my dear sister. I'm speaking to the Spirit. And I command you to hold your peace in the name of Jesus until your time of ministry will happen. And I watched her as she was chained between her husband and the psychiatrist that brought her. And she tried to resist. She tried to open her mouth and she could not. It was at an altar in that church when they took that dear lady to a side room to pray for her. That Pastor Faulkner said, everybody on your knees, and if you're here as a child and you're foolish, get out of this building. But if you're serious about God, get up here on the altar and begin to pray. And my sister and I, we both went up there and knelt before the Lord. And we listened to the tumult that was going on as God was setting that woman free. And I said, that altar, I said, God, this Christ has the power to break every bondage every addiction every horrible thing that the enemy does and i'm sitting there or kneeling there and i'm sensing god's presence so strong and there was no more fear because i knew that god was in control and that he was going to set that lady free and when she walked out you could see in her face she was free she needed counsel afterwards folks she did but she was free of the demons that controlled her it was at an altar that i understood that the key to breaking bondages is not a better doctrine, but a deeper walk with Jesus and accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you these things as I try to bring us to a time where I'm going to call for as many as like to just revive a service at these altars. 
going to move that table out of the way in just a moment. So these altars are free. And I'm going to invite you to come down and just before the Lord, come and kneel at an altar and seek the Lord. Because I believe that God wants to restore something. Something prophetic is being released as we access those things. I know there's some who need to watch this thing online that are not here today. Because as I was preparing this, I heard the Lord say, there are some strongholds that need to be broken. Some thought processes that need to be healed. There have been some vows that have been spoken. Abuses that have not been healed. Things that are hindering the move of God in your heart. And listen, folks, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I've seen everything. I've seen all the goofiness. I've seen all the stupidity. I've seen stuff that was pure flesh. And now I've also seen the pure move of the Holy Spirit. And the glory of God that descends when people will focus on who Jesus is. And allow the Holy Spirit to have access to your life. And I've seen. And so I know for a period of time I took the posture as a Bible college students say, I've seen so much abuse, I don't like it, I'm going to reject the whole thing. And so we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Every revival in history has been accompanied by things that were uncomfortable for the status quo. Help me, somebody. The status quo, you know, whenever Jesus did certain things in his ministry, it shook up the status quo. He's preaching in a synagogue and some guy blurts out under the influence of demons. And Jesus spoke, and I'm going to talk about that in a few weeks, set him free. Philip went down to Samaria to preach the gospel after all the persecution that had happened. Here's another thing, dear ones. The church is so freaked out by the things that they don't understand. And rather than ask Jesus, they've just categorically thrown it out and said, I'm not gonna, I don't want anything to do with those people because they hold their hands up high. They shout and praise. They speak in tongues, dear God. You take it out of this book and then I'll say it no longer matters. But this Bible tells you what God has placed in his plan for people to be empowered in these last days. What is the stronghold? What is it? Listen, are you sitting here this morning? Or are you one of those the Bible says are so full that you're not attracted to the invitation of the Spirit of God this morning? The Bible says this in Proverbs. I'm going to give you the reference. 27 7 Proverbs says to the hungry I'm sorry to the to those that are full this is the beginning of the verse to those that are full even a honeycomb is repulsive but to those that are starving or hungry even bitter things taste sweet and what does Jesus say Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Now I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I want you to pray fervently. And I want you to obey the Lord this morning. Would you stand? Because we're winding down. The way this service will end this morning is I will dismiss you to go as you wish. But I'm going to usher this particular thing to all of you today. If you're full of the hurts from the past, get rid of them and lay them at Jesus' feet. If you stand here this morning and you're confused or maybe don't, you're just a little hesitant, let me promise you something. I've been a pastor for a lot of years and the one thing I will not allow is I will not allow something goofy, something demonic, something fleshly to destroy your confidence that you can come to this place and know that we will protect the move of the Spirit of God, hear me, we will protect the precious Holy Spirit's right, not that He needs our protection, but His right to do what He wants in this service. 
And I don't want to be in the way. And as I prayed over this and I sought the Lord, I thought, God, I could be so misunderstood. But I'm telling you, there's something lacking. And we think that everybody, someone around us right now may be dealing with something so horrific and they will cover it up because they don't want to look bad. Or maybe someone has a word of encouragement to speak over somebody. But you've been taught this idea that only the holy people can be used of God. And I want to tell you, this is a whole other sermon, but I'm going to tell you right now, dear ones. We have laid aside a Christ-given gifting that says every member of the body is a minister of the Holy Spirit to the needs of one another and to our world. And you have stood by, many of you, and I'm not being mean, I'm just telling you, if, if we said to you, come up and pray for someone, you'd stand there and say, not me, I'm not qualified, I don't know what to do. And I'll tell you something, that, that kind of fear... And that believing a lie that says somehow this is only for those that that are really spiritual and really holy, you missed it. If Christ is in you and the Holy Spirit dwells within you and he's given gifts as the Bible says he has, then you are capable of ministering to someone around you as the Spirit of God leads. Some of you were here some years ago when I came in the service and the Lord told me, when you come in this morning, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to be difficult. Oh, well, thanks. He said, I want you to prophesy over every person who needs a word from the Lord. Now, if you don't understand what that means, it basically, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. In other words, God said you have an encouraging word for every person who needs one right now. But it's not just a general word, but it's a specific word. And I said, yes. And with fear and trembling... <laughs> I said, if anyone needs a word from the Lord this morning, come forward. And I'm thinking one or two. And 14 people came forward. And I go, thanks, Lord. (laughs) But that morning, God gave a word, a specific word to every person. Not because my brain was intact, but because the Spirit of God was speaking through me to share things that every one of those people who got a word said that it was absolutely the Spirit of God. Only God could have revealed it to him. And I'm not God, but it was his Holy Spirit that did it. And there were some dramatic changes that happened in people's lives. But you know, what I said last week, or about last week, and it broke my heart, that I almost missed an opportunity for the Spirit of God to do something. And then when I got the privilege to come and pray for Kenya, And I felt the Holy Spirit. And I felt, Father, His pleasure that we would take a moment out of our need to get to the next restaurant, that we would just take time to pray for one another. And I want to invite you right now. As I pray, I want to invite you to come. And if you'd wish to pray here at the altar, just kneel there. Pray as as long as you want. Leave when you want. But come and make it a prophetic act to say today, Lord, I'm establishing an altar through a prophetic act that I'm going to seek your face. I'm not going to walk out of here empty. And I'm, I, This is the thing, folks. You can be so self-satisfied or so hung up on things that you, you can't get over that you are full of everything that will keep you from being touched by the Spirit of God. I know of a person who, because of the abuses they've experienced in their life in the past, They categorically reject anything that has to do with emotion or anything that has to do with someone calling a a, a prophetic thing. And as a result of that, their heart is hard and God can't get through that wall. And I'm going to tell you something. That's on you. He wants to come in and do something really special. So I'd like you to do this. Bow your head for a moment and pray with me. And then I'm just going to dismiss those who need to go, wish to go. But I want to say with all my heart, if you're full, You'll, you, you can go away. If you believe you're full, and this is not a condemning thing. I'm just saying, folks, I've been in this place where I refused as a leader to go forward for prayer because I thought I've got it. And I, I find out by the precious, faithful dealing of the Spirit that, that everything I think I have is not all that I have. And there's a lot more to God than what I have. And so I want more of Him. So pray with me right now. 
pray with me right now. Just in your own space there. Just say, God, have your way right now in this place. 